start putting a spotlight on all these missing and murdered Indigenous men. He was walking by and I said, I'll see you later, bud. So then he went to school and then he had the meeting with the principal and was supposed to go back to class and never did. There's so many people going missing and there's so much young kids, there's so much elders. What I did was I put a label in a baggie. Anybody anywhere that has, that sees my son, um, they'd have my phone number right on their phone. And it seems like it's one, one article in the paper and then it's never spoken of again. Every day I used to uh, call up North and talk to him and my auntie said that he was lost. I have to think that he's okay until I hear it different. I just want him to come home. Each of these men and boys had a family, devastated by their loss, and left wondering what happened. An APTN investigation has revealed more than 600 cases of missing and murdered Indigenous men and boys in Canada. A staggering number, each with its own story. I see women's pictures everywhere. They're all over Facebook, too. I don't have the money to put up a bulletin board, but somebody out there should fund something for our men. i just like to see the police actually do something about it. Start putting some a spotlight on all these missing and murdered Indigenous men. Lucas Dagerness was just 14 years old when he went missing. His mother reported him missing on June 7, 2007. And this was the high school. Though there have been many sightings of him, none have been confirmed. This is where he went to high school. This is the last time Gina seen him was here. He was last seen at his Prince George High School in northern British Columbia. He left there and said he never went to class. A charming town for some. It's also the starting point of the infamous Highway of Tears. So we'd be putting posters up all around, like you know, every like one of these poles, we would stop and put posters up. Me and my dad were out driving the roads all the time. Every day, what's well, called, we were putting posters up all over. He was adorable, like, made me laugh. He was, he was a good kid. Saturday night, because you're at the hospital. Lorena Perry remembers her nephew as a sweet boy, and memories of their movie nights pour in. They sound vicious, but they're not. Or he'd like lay in bed and cuddle up behind you and be like, oh, I love you, Auntie, and I'm like, oh, I love you too. Fred Perry vividly remembers when his nephew went missing. He was 14, you know, just a teenager. I like playing sports, I like playing basketball, I like playing baseball. Perry spent hours putting up posters and searching the streets of Prince George. He was walking by and I said, I'll see you later, bud. So he left and then he went to school and then he had the meeting with the principal and was supposed to go back to class and never did. Last scene, um, did the family start to worry? Oh, we were worried instantly because he never came home, right? Do you think that his friends might know something? 
if anybody would, they would, right? I felt bad because it was in between places between my sisters, my dad's, our place, and my mom's. But that wasn't fair for him. He would take turns staying here with my mom and my sister, and then he would come over to our place every once in a while, and then also at my little sister's house. Moving from the big city to here is kind of, I think, was a down or two. You know, you're leaving all your friends. Yeah, that's hard. Coming back, starting to start new. What we had thought always was that he went back to Edmonton because that's where he just came from. That would make sense. Well, I miss my nephew with my whole heart. And I just want him to come home. I have to think that he's okay until I hear different. Every every day I look at a star. It's the first star I see and I make a wish. It's always about him coming home. This highway is infamous. Dozens of missing and murdered indigenous women have disappeared along the 725 kilometer stretch that winds along to the west coast, ending in Prince Rupert. But lesser known are the missing and murdered indigenous men and boys of the Highway of Tears. An APTN investigation reveals that since 1988, 19 indigenous men and boys have been murdered or disappeared along the highway. 16-year-old Colton Fleury went missing from a local motel. So that happened for about two days. And then His mother, Phyllis Fleury, saw him get up to go to the bathroom in the early morning hours of May 3rd. He had just come back into her care. This place used to be called uh, the Downtowner Motel. So I worked here and I cleaned all these rooms when the they had a new owner, and I lived in that one that's way in the corner. The ministry came to drop Colton off. They brought him in there with a little garbage bag of clothes, only a quarter full bag of clothes. After two years of being in and out of care and in the group homes and a foster home. Phyllis knows the child welfare system all too well as a 60 scoop survivor. If you were raised with somebody from residential schools, you didn't get the hugs, you didn't get the I love yous. You just basically got what, what you essentially needed was food in a bed, right? Fleury worked hard to provide a better life for her kids, and she remembers her son Colton as a happy baby. He was the sweetest little boy. He, he was the baby of the family. Very handsome and very uh, temperamental, I guess you can say. What's up? Yeah, I've got supplies. Do you want meat and cheese? Okay. So you're Rachel and Phoebe? Yeah. Right? How old were you, Rachel? 45. That was the beginning of one of my journeys. Uh, I went to Ketwanga Treatment Center. <laughs> and, um,
part of going to a treatment center is getting rid of the um, toxic relationships. So through my pregnancy, I was sober through all of that. She had just regained custody of her son, and the two of them stayed in this downtown motel. But the next day, he vanished. I wish I could just turn back time and say, hey, where are you going? And I just thought he went to the bathroom. But this is the last time I've seen him. <laughs> So these are the lifesaver kits. I hand out the kits that I make each week. Um, safe supply kits. I know my son's addicted to heroin. I, that, you know, and somebody's doing this for him. Somebody's feeding him. Have to pack the RO Narcan around which I've already used quite a bit. I've used it on a young boy last year. We got donations of blankets and some warm socks. So I guess um, my supply kits will have to go in my trunk. What I did was I put a label in a baggie so that the cigarette doesn't get wet and I hand this out. Anybody anywhere that has, that sees my son, um, they'd have my phone number right on their phone. They could take a picture and call me right away. So what makes you want to get this program? Well, because I went down to Vancouver about so far, I've been down there 16 times, and... Fleury has spent countless hours searching the streets of Vancouver. She prepares meals, safe supply kits, and offers warm clothing to those in need. She hopes that if her son is out there, others are doing the same work. And the thing is that when I narcan this young boy, um, he reminded me so much of Colton, and I just broke down. <laughs> when Colton went missing, they have him on camera that he walked from that room, no bag, seven o'clock in the morning, and he went walking that way. I thought he jumped up and went to the bathroom. When I got up to go to work at nine o'clock, he wasn't on his bed. And I didn't think anything of it, you know. I just got up and did my work because he's home now. And I never seen him again. <laughs> my mom, she, she, she called me and asked me if he's been around. And she was like, if he does come around, tell him call me or get home or whatever and I was like yeah he's probably just like to me I figured like he was just out with his friend I don't know. the cops didn't even do anything until two or three weeks later when they finally put that missing person out it took that long you know But they also come in with the same, uh, the same conclusion. Colton's not in Prince George, and uh, foul play is not suspected. And Do they tell you why that they don't think foul play is suspected? No, she never did tell me that. And what are your thoughts on that? Um, that they want to sit behind a desk, and I hate to say it, 
let me do all the work and um oh, oh, oh. I have to get out of the car this time. You guys need a sandwich? Oh, Phoebe, how are you? Just yeah. last week I realized you know, I have to be thankful for everything that I'm going through because yeah, I'm trying to change to be a better person. Yeah. And uh, yep. because I went to Vancouver so much and saw so much need for outreach, I came back and that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> you guys want a sandwich? I know you do. <laughs> do you want a meat and cheese, both of you? And water? One of my friends just said, hey, we need um, somebody to help with the cultural center. They wanted me so much for outreach because that's exactly what I wanted to do. She looks like she needs it. You want a sandwich? What's your name? Christina. Christina, and how old are you? 31. Do you need um, smoking in a bubble too? Yes, please. Okay. 31? Okay. Okay, she needs a smoking in a bubble. You want a cigarette? Yes. That's my missing son. Oh. Yeah, my phone number. It's a label, you could just put it behind your phone or something, right? Okay. I got you some socks and a blanket. Thank you. She gets tips that her son was seen in Vancouver, and she believes Colton is still alive. I got some warm socks, you need that? I have, I, I don't know if I could find another men's one, but... Yeah. Fleury knows the downtown east side well. It's not the first time she's had to search for a loved one there. Mona Wilson is Colton's auntie. Colton was just born when we went down there and uh, we saw Mona across the street, but her dad we didn't want us, us to meet her. He didn't want us to see her the way she was. And a month later, she was found in the pig pen farm. That might be a big thing of why there's so much attention on the missing women was because of that pig pen farm. And I can't take away from that because we were a part of that too. We had to go down there and my ex-estranged husband had to go to the trailer and look at belongings that might have been Mona's. I see women's pictures everywhere. And they're all over Facebook too. And I, I was wondering about that too. Like, it's not just women that are getting missing, it's men too. You know, they talk about the Highway of Tears, and there are n no men's pictures. <laughs> Barry Seymour was 32 years old when he vanished from Prince George. He had traveled from his home community in Fort Ware to attend his son's ninth birthday. Charles and his dad, and that's on his ninth birthday. Cosmic bowling. Go on. And Tyrez Seymour holds close the last memories of his father. Me and mom and I think Graham and them went to the bowling alley and that's where we met up with him. And he, he brought me presents and we had a good time bowling and the last time that I saw him was at the Camelot Park in 
parking lot. It's been nearly a decade since he was last seen on May 26, 2012. Every day I used to uh, call up north and talk to him. And uh, when I went to call him, um, my auntie said that he was lost. I just I couldn't believe it. She started crying on the phone after she told me that. and. I uh, gave the phone to my mom, and yeah, it was just it was a hard day. I met him through my cousin Amaral. She was actually dating his brother, and she brought me on a family trip. <laughs> she just set you guys up? Yeah, literally. Seymour's <laughs> <laughs> former partner, Charity Rivard, says his disappearance is unlike him. He was like, he was very outdoorsy. Who's this with him in there, Bubs? That's... Oh, it's Delaney. Yeah. Yeah, so it's another one of him hunting. That was like his favorite thing to do? Yeah, he yeah. was like, he was very outdoorsy. Yeah, I love the cowboy boots. It's just like, he has a style going there. <laughs> he really wanted to wear those. <laughs> the two were high school sweethearts and the new family enjoyed exploring the outdoors. He was very traditional, he was super kind. <laughs> and he was a great father. This is our family photos from, Charles was like one and a half here, I think. Yesterday? Sometimes it feels like it's just yesterday and then sometimes it's just like a, a life that we once lived that's, you know. Sometimes, uh. I don't know, during recess I would see someone that would make me look like him and I would just, just completely flip, I guess, I don't know. He should be here. There's no reason why he shouldn't be here. He didn't deserve this. Rivard says there needs to be a national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous men and boys. Start putting some a spotlight on all these missing and murdered Indigenous men. Barry's not the only one. There's so many people going missing. There's so much young kids. There's so much elders. They're just like, it's just, and it seems like it's one, one article in the paper and then it's never spoken of again. He was young and vibrant and loving, caring, and you know had so much potential to go so many different ways in life. You know, when we talk about our indigenous brothers, when we talk about victims of homicide, and knowing that indigenous men are at the highest rate of being victims of homicide, where's the supports coming from, police? Where's the support?